record going. I want to welcome everyone to supply chain management for your business. Uh, I'm going to start off by giving you a little intro to SCORE if you are, aren't familiar. Uh, SCORE offers a, a couple different tools for small business owners. One of them is training, and we have um, mostly webinars, but a few workshops that are in-person workshops that we are starting to, to, to put out there. Uh, I encourage you to check out our, the website or the newsletter for all the new offerings we have this season. We have uh, several new topics for, for us, and we're excited to be able to share those with you. Uh, the most important thing that SCORE does, however, is the mentoring. Mentoring is free and confidential. Our mentors are volunteers who have a wide variety of expertise and knowledge that they want to share with you. Uh, who do we work with? We work with those that are thinking they might want to start a business and they're just not sure. We work with those that are in that business planning stage and getting ready to go to the next steps. Uh, and we work with people that are already in business. Uh, maybe they need help with accounting or marketing, or perhaps they're looking for a, a growth strategy. So we work with the whole range. To get a mentor, you do not have to have a business license already. A first session is going to be about knowing, learning about your goals, and the mentor will work with you to formulate some sort of plan or perhaps give you homework to help you work toward that goal. Uh, oftentimes, uh, additional mentors are brought in as you work through the process of, of achieving, achieving that goal. So I strongly encourage you to consider uh, a SCORE mentor. I will be putting all the chapter websites into the chat here shortly uh, that you can reach out to to get a mentor. You can also just put a note in chat and say, hey, I'd like to meet with one of our presenters perhaps today or a mentor in my chapter, and we will connect you with that, with that, with them. Uh, while you're on those chapter website, I strongly encourage you to also check out the library section and the tools and templates. There's all kinds of templates, blogs, little tidbits of information that anyone will find helpful. Uh, we are going to just use chat today. So if you have any questions for our presenters, just go ahead and throw that into the chat. Uh, we do have a, a nice selection of presenters today with us, so we should be able to answer all your questions without any issue. Uh, I'm going to go put this down. Oops, it's my bio. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to be introducing Chuba, and I lost, I lost my uh, my bio. Chuba, would you mind introducing yourself? <laughs> Right. Okay, I apologize. It's, it's the screen went away. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you. For that. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, our webinar on supply chain management. My name is Chuba Udoku. I am currently um, uh, a uh, managing partner at Epitas uh, Tech Advisors in Boston. And um, I also have a strong background in technology. I've uh, been a senior executive in different types of companies and have uh, been successfully done small companies, large companies, done startups. I've been a uh, SCORE uh, mentor for quite a few years and uh, have a lots and lots of industry experience that I've been very blessed to be able to share with uh, most of my, my uh, SCORE clients. Uh, today, we're going to talk about supply chain. And uh, we're going to start out by talking about what is supply chain. Uh, we're going to go through a number of case studies. Uh, and we're going to talk about what causes supply chain disruption and the, some of the strategies that we recommend be used to mitigate. Uh, and then and we we'll also end up with some closure and key messages and questions. Uh, again, Teresa has indicated the questions will come from the chat today. What is supply chain? I'm the first person up. Um, supply chain is a network between a company and its suppliers. And it is a specific part to the final buyer. So you, as, a, as a manufacturer or a service provider, you're, you, you're, you're targeted at your final buyer. That network includes uh, activities, different things, activities, people, entities, information, and resources. A supply chain also represents the steps it takes to get the product or service from its original state to the customer. 
So if you think about a final assembly, let's say uh, a, uh, a, a car, there are many, many several components that make up that car. And supply chain is about how you manage all, getting all those components to the final assembly points, to the point where you can actually manufacture the car and deliver the car to the, to the end customer. Companies develop supply chains so they can reduce their costs and remain competitive in the business landscape. And in, uh, in the, the current economy, we uh, most supply chains are optimized um, to reduce amount of uh, you know uh, inventory. It's called inventory optimization. Supply chains help support that and supply and keep keep the company by reducing inventory charges and keep keep costs uh, under control. Also, it helps lower. Uh, the cost of actually this, the individual components or services that make up the business. Supply chain management is a crucial process because it, it optimizes supply chain and results in lower costs and faster production cycles. I guess I just talked about that. The, for most manufacturers and most service providers, optimizing that cost and lowering the cost and also making sure that you have the right services or components in place for to essentially uh, reduce your production cycle time. The entities in supply chain include the producers, the folks that actually make the raw materials or the raw components. That's actually crucial for you to understand. Um, you know, it, 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 whether your business is a service business or an actual manufacturing business, you actually depend on some core products or core, core components to be produced to enable your product or service. The vendors are part of the supply chain. The warehouses where you store materials in case of materials uh, that are manufactured is also part of the supply chain. Transportation companies are part of the uh, supply chain. And in most cases, distributors distribution centers and retailers are part of the, of the supply chain. The functions in supply chain include product development. Somebody has to make their original product, uh, marketing operations, uh, distribution and finance, and customer service. Those are critical for you to understand. Each one of those a critical optimizing cost at the product development level is important. Uh, making sure that your marketing operations is optimized uh, to deliver the messaging, et cetera, to the customers to stimulate demand is important. Uh, the cost of distribution and the, the logistics around distribution, whether you're distributing on the web or whether you actually have a physical distribution of product, uh, that's also a very, very important uh, key component in the supply chain. Finance, money is part of that, being able to reduce the cost, but also be able to making sure that financing is available at the right stage within the supply chain to optimize uh, the time that you get your product to, to, to market. And obviously customer service is, is critical. The uh, stages in supply chain include logistics, uh, the operations, uh, marketing and sales and services. Those are all extensive uh, stages in the supply chain. Supply management uh, is key. Um, the, the suppliers have to be able to produce the product or the, or the service on time and with quality. And all of that reflects on your end product and also your reputation in the marketplace. Uh, making sure that you, so your suppliers have a sustainable production capability and support ability and system in place. Again, as a small company, this is crucial because you're not essentially funded to be able to do all this work yourself. So it's important to make sure that your, your suppliers are able to support you through this process. Understanding the supplier's capability to manage a sub-supplier and, and smaller expect, and similar expectations. Again, not everything comes together in your shop. Uh, there are uh, subcomponent suppliers within your suppliers that are part of your, your supply chain uh, ecosystem that you need to understand and completely un and control through your suppliers. 
being able to handle uh, issues, mitigating supplier quality issues and delivery issues, making sure that you have corrective um, action plans in place. And this is part of the due diligence in selecting uh, a supplier, making sure there's the capability um, to do so. And ongoing reporting systems to ensure unplanned issues are being addressed to avoid disruption. Again, transparency from your supplier is key. Making sure that you understand that, then this part of your due diligence, the ability to give you this is key. These all these key items that are listed here should be stuff that you you know focus on in the process of selecting uh, a supplier um, uh, for your your business or service. Again, supply chain management is a is a very important part of the business process. Um, it, in many different links, there, there are many, many, many different links in, in, that require skill and expertise. Uh, when it's effective, it can lower your overall cost and help you boost your profitability. If any one of these links breaks down, it can affect the rest of the chain. And this applies both for product and services uh, coming together to pro produce um, you know, a product or service for your business. Again, this is this is a kind of a, a, an overview. We're not getting into some case studies. The first case study that we're going to go through right now is going to be led by David Banks. David, uh, hi there. Um, so I'm David Banks. Um, I've been a score mentor for a little over a year now, and I I spent my career uh, in the energy sector managing uh, supply chain and trading operations in Europe and North America. Um, I launched a consulting firm in 2016, specializing in this area of supply chain and operations and, um, and serving clients today. Um, so Chibu, could you go to the next slide? Or did you hand over control? Yep, um, I can do that. All right, we were experiencing, experimenting a little bit with this stuff today. Yeah, you have control, David. Okay, I got control. Great. Okay, so this um, this case study fits really nicely into the general supply chain model that that um, Chu just described. It's actually a pretty simple one. It fits on one slide. Um, other supply chains are like massively complicated and whatever. Um, and the, the score clients that I've dealt with so far generally. Um, in this area are generally retailers. So they're operating gas stations with companion businesses like C stores. Um, but also a lot of SCORE clients have fuel as a significant component of their cost structure. So understanding the supply chain and what's driving fuel prices is, is very important for them to manage their, their business as well. And even for, for those of you who really don't have fuel or you're not operating a gas station. Um, this is a good case study because we can talk about each uh, real world example, each of those components of a supply chain that, that Chu was just talking about. Um, so there's a couple of key concepts here that I wanna bring out up front. One is the supply chain is made up of a bunch of links and many of those links are outside of the control of the small business operator. In fact, most of them are, um, but that doesn't matter. It's, it's really important that you, you know and understand what those links are so you can react and plan your business accordingly. Um, so uh, I think that's my way of saying it's worth paying attention even if you don't run a gas station. <laughs> um, working left to right on this slide, the raw material in, um, in the case of petroleum is crude oil. And crude oil is part of the left here, um, is notoriously volatile. Um, prices of crude swing wildly up and down. Um, and the impact of those prices comes straight through to the end user. Um, and things, as anything on the planet can actually drive a crude price move from recent invasion of Ukraine by Russia, um, changes in the Chinese economy or 
crude wells freezing over Texas. And it's this raw material in this supply chain is, is truly global and, and is impacted by a huge range of potential events. Uh, the next big link in the chain I'm circling here, I'm not sure if you can see it because it's a little pencil, um, is the refinery. So in the case of this supply chain, the processing plant is a refinery, which basically turns crude into finished products like gasoline and heating oil. Um, there's all sorts of uh, elements that can affect the, refin the refining link, um, such as refineries going out for maintenance or transportation to and from the refinery getting constrained or other impacts that will cause the, the price of refined products to uh, go up and down. Um, with refined products, it's, it's different than crude. It's not as global. Um, it tends to be localized by refineries around where the products consume. Um, but again, it's, it's also volatile and it's something that needs to be monitored carefully by, by small businesses impacted. Uh, in the case of this supply chain, the warehouse function um, are these big barrels, these storage um, facilities that you probably see them easily when you're driving along the freeway, uh, especially along coastal areas. See these giant drums. Um, those are petroleum product warehouses. Um, and that's where basically uh, the wholesale suppliers start to take over. Um, they store product in these in these giant drums, and they uh, supply the final link in the transportation train, chain of having the the, the, um, the trucks deliver the uh, product to the gas station. Um, so that's um, sort of mapping basically the the petroleum supply chain into Chuba's general model. Um, the one basic thing I think we're going to try to get over to you guys today is that mitigation and mitigation of supply chain risk is is critical and on the parts you can control, um, you do that as much as possible, obviously. And for a supply uh, a petroleum uh, re retailer, gasoline retailer, uh, his best thing is to have multiple sources of of transportation to the site and having multiple sources of warehouse supply. Um, some of these uh, warehouses are, are supply terminals are served by pipelines, some are served by vessels. In the perfect world, you get some of each. So, you know, if there's a rupture in, the, in a pipeline like happened last year, um, you can switch over to a terminal that's supplied by vessel and, and you're in business. Um, so that's that's one mitigation uh, technique I just wanted to get across. Um, and as with any sort of primary and secondary source of supply, it's good to um, it's good to use them for the retailer to use them periodically, um, just to make sure that their relationships are in place and people will show up with a product when they want them to and essentially keep that secondary supply as a hot standby for your primary supply. So going on to the next slide. Here we go. Um, we talked about most of the things on this slide. Crude driven by all sorts of worldwide events and disruptions occur every other day. Um, gasoline refined products, you get situations that happen all along the refined product section of the supply chain that also disrupt and cause big spike price, uh, price spikes. So uh, as we as mentioning before that the important thing is diversity of supply, get multiple suppliers, um, different modes of transportation, uh, trucking relationships, and generally um, have a good understanding of the end-to-end -end supply chain so you're not caught as reacting to events that are, that are affecting, you know, your core um, supply uh, materials that you're putting to sale. 
And finally, the, the other thing for a, a gasoline retailer in particular is what he can do most, what he can control most is setting his prices that, he's, that he sells to his customers. And that basically is where this all comes together and, and a customer takes, uh, the retailer takes into account everything he understands about the supply chain leading up to him. And also fortunately in, in um, petroleum retailing, it's easy to observe what your competitors are doing. So um, this is what it all boils down to really on a day-to-day -day basis for a um, gasoline retail retailer is setting your prices. Um, so that's, um, I think that's mainly what I got on this. Um, I think I will now turn it over to Elena. Um, and she, uh, Elena is a former biotech R&D executive and currently works as scientific advisor and consultant to various companies. Um, and she also manages her own startups. Her teams have invented, developed, and commercialized many successful products for life science research and biomanufacturing. And Elena, Elena holds a PhD in biology. So here, here she is. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for giving me a chance to share one of my case studies with you. Um, my sample example comes from biomanufacturing world. So um, for those of you who don't know what biomanufacturing is, sometimes also called bioprocess, um, it's a production of biological drugs. So things like monoclonal antibodies, insulin, vaccines are all produced in bioprocess. <clears throat> and it's a very fast growing industry. So we have 10 to 20% annual growth for many, many years in that industry. So the interesting part of it is that um, all biomanufacturing uses um, all Manufacturing, biomanufacturing companies or pharma companies use those um, sterile assemblies, which basically are big plastic bags, which have tons of different components connected to them, very um, sophisticated high-tech sensors, uh, connectors, sterile connectors, and so on. Um, but they're all connected by uh, basically sterile silicon tubing. And it's a very generic, very commodity-like silicon tubing. And um, a few years ago, we had an interesting case when we almost shut down manufacturing of biological drugs globally because the silicon tubing provider had a shortage. Um, I lived through that situation. It was extremely stressful. And so I wanted to share with you some, with you some, of, the, um, some of the lessons we learned. So first of all, uh, let's think about why did that happen? Well, first of all, we found out that um, all uh, sterile assembly suppliers, which is only about five in the world, and I worked for one of them, use the same um, supplier of silicon tubing. Um, we didn't know that, but it turned out to be the case. It was a very respectable, uh, mature supplier, and we all used the same. Uh, since it always was considered to be a commodity, we didn't really think about you know, uh, finding another source of a supplier another source of a tubing. It turned out that because we all were growing so fast, the whole biomanufacturing world is growing at 10 to 20%. We're supplying products for biomanufacturing world, we're growing at 10 to 20%. And tubing supplier kind of didn't catch up with the trend. So they did not have time to expand their capacity. And um, as a result of it, they had a shortage of a product or a supply. So, uh, the disaster was averted. Fortunately, we all were mature large companies and we had sufficient supply to cover us for a few months. Um, and, um, and so we uh, basically were able to uh, validate another supplier in four months working 24 seven. It was extremely stressful, but we've been able to do that. Um, we learned three lessons from that. First, um, identify all critical parts of your product, not just high-tech expensive big parts of a product. Sometimes a small screw or small component, a uh, small ingredient can make all the difference and what's going to happen if you can't buy it. Even if you buy this on Amazon or Home Depot, that may not be available tomorrow. You never know who is going to get out of business, who is gonna go on a back order. 
So know all of those components. Um, if you can have a contract with your supplier, it is very helpful. If it's a un uh, if it's a unique part and you cannot uh, find alternative source, um, have at least a significant inventory of that part, which will allow you to produce your product for a while and find a plan B, whatever that is going to be. Um, alternative source is extremely important. We call it dual source, which means that you have two sources of the same uh, component for every component built uh, used in your assembly in your product. Um, and not just have it, not have dual suppliers. So the fact that you know another supplier doesn't help if you haven't used that supplier for multiple years and all of a sudden you want to buy something from them, well, they may not have that part available and may not work with your product. So um, have them verified, have them validated and use two suppliers for each of your components if possible. And the third uh, lesson is communication. So communication is a solution for many problems. And um, you really need to tell your supplier if you're growing really fast. If you're going to double your uh, needs, uh, your requests for next year, well, you probably want to let your supplier know because they may not be able to meet your demand. So good communication with your supplier is extremely important. So that was my quick example. And with that, uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce our next panelist, um, Richard Rosenblatt. Um, so Richard has been a SCORE mentor for nine years. Um, he's helping clients with business planning, strategic planning, import experts, supply chain management, business contracts, and supplier negotiations. Um, Richard has worked for the Polaroid Corporation for 30 years, and he was responsible for sorting and supplying chemicals for most of the Polaroid products. Um, after leaving Polaroid, um, he continued in supply chain management operations in McDermott, Air Liquid America, and 7-Eleven. Uh, his last position in supply chain was sourcing chemicals in Southeast Asia for a major chemical supplier. Um, Richard was a certified purchasing manager and he holds a degree in chemistry and an MBA. So Richard, floor is yours. Thank you. Next slide, there you go. So today I'll talk a little bit about two of the uh, problems that I encountered while I was at Polaroid. Polaroid was, had, uh, the purchasing was based on relationships and information sharing. Today it is the most, today it is more impersonal use of the internet. But the use of Zoom really changes the way we can interact with companies and uh, would have saved me from traveling all over the world continually. Um, but there still is a lack of that personal relationship that you have to overcome. Next slide. So what, what we did was, is based on relationships, meeting in person, sharing information about plans, volumes, and what was happening in the company and in the supplier's company. And it was very important to know that we, our supply would be insured because certainly in my position, I, was, I could not allow the company to be shut down for lack of a chemical. Next slide. What uh, it's beneficial, we had uh, hundreds of chemicals that we used at Polaroid. It, um, the slide before that, slide before that. Whoops. Here we go. Okay. So, what you have to be aware of today and what we constantly are aware of then. Let me see if I can shut that off. Um, you've got to be aware of what's going on politically in your world, environmentally. The things that you use could be uh, modified or discontinued because of environmental constraints. Tariffs, as we've seen, where a supplier will be restricted from supplying to the United States. Um, and Transportation costs, which because of the cost of fuel and the cost of labor are continuing to escalate. And the same with labor costs. 
And you've also got to be aware of labor shortages. As you see, many restaurants are really struggling to have the right number of people to run a restaurant. Many of them have gone out of business. And this can happen to you also in your supply. Next slide. What you ought to do is take a look at your source of your source of supply. Focus on the single source ones because they're the most vulnerable. If you can dual source or multiple source, that's the best place to be, or at least to know where you can go if your single source disappears on you. And having more supplier helps in managing the cost and building a relationship that's both of you are dependent on each other. And knowing that you also have a commodity where there are a number of different companies that can supply that, and it's a place to be less worried. Although I went through the oil shortage in my career where it was very difficult to supply certain solvents and certainly you had a great impact on cost. So concentrate on your single sources and play what if you lose that source so that you have a backup plan because it can surprise you. And I'm gonna talk about two of those in the next, next few minutes. My first assignment when I joined the purchasing group was the source of discontinued material. Union Carbide made something called Dynel, and Dynel was used in the carpeting industry, but it also was the, the um, critical chemical used in the foil stripe, the, the pod that got between the positive and negative of the uh, film. And so we, we called it a developer pod. And it had a strip on it that we put on there that had dynel uh, that had been dissolved in a solvent and was the release agent. So that when that, uh, the film positive negative sandwich went through the, the spreader bars in the, in the camera, the developer we call goo was spread over the um, format between the positive and negative. And that's what caused the development of the uh, picture that you had exposed. So uh, when I came into this position, the first thing I had to do was find a replacement for Dynel. And we didn't want to really replace it with something very different because that would have been an extremely expensive investment on our part. So I telephoned, called Union Carbide, and they were kind enough to give me all the people who were customers of Dynel. Many of them realized they would have to replace the Dynel and were interested in getting rid of the inventory that they have. And so I was able to purchase material Dynel from a number of different customers of Union Carbide. I ended up filling up a warehouse which actually outlisted the life of Polaroid Corporation in the 40 some years afterwards. Uh, I don't know what happened to the rest of the Dynel, but at least we kept things going by having that supply available. The second. Then this, the second thing that I was gonna talk about today, the second problem, we were using something called EMA, ethylene, maleic, and hydride which was put into a solvent layer, coated onto our positive film. It's the first layer in the positive film of what there are many layers, and it was the acid layer. And so when you, the pod was spread between the rollers of the positive and negative, that alkaline material reached down into the L coat where the EMA was, and it neutralized it. And when it was neutralized up to seven, as a neutral uh, body, uh, the development process stopped. Well, Monsanto had been our supplier for many years. They were a sole source. We weren't worried about them. Well, maybe we should have been, as it turned out. And we continued to put pressure on them to reduce prices because we purchased hundreds of thousands of pounds of this in our, in our photographic business. One day they contacted us and said they had decided to get out of the business. They'd be willing to sell us the process at a very handsome price, but their patents had already expired. Um, Polaroid had a very vast chemical research group 
And the people running that felt that they could develop a process without Monsanto's help. And we could then source that with one of our chemical suppliers who would make the EMA for us. And that's exactly what we did. Over a number of months, we developed a process, we put it through a pilot plant, and then we sent chemical engineers out to the company we had chosen to make the EMA. And they continued to make it until Polaroid went out of business. So that's, that's my story of two of the many problems that I had to face. Um, your next speaker, Prabhat Kumar, who's affectionately by all of us called PK, has been a SCORE mentor for over six years. His skills include planning, prototyping, manufacturing, and patents. He has a PhD in material science and has over 35 patents. Prior to joining the SCORE, he worked as an R&D um, R executive in the specialty material metals industry for over 40 years. And that's where he learned about the criticality of managing the supply chain. PK, you're next. Thank you, Richard. Um, is Mike, Mike, Mike is on, right? Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I want to share a couple of examples with you. Uh, one of these is the, when the raw material is controlled by the mines and mines decide that they want to raise the price of the raw material, so they stop production. And you don't really have much uh, uh, legal leverage with the mines. So it happened to us two or three times during my career in industry. And the price of the raw material went up from $35 to over $900 a pound. The material in this case was tantalum, and uh, it disrupted the entire supply chain, as you can imagine, because the, the disruption was uh, on the, at the mines. But the, this material is considered a very critical for the defense of the country. So we were able to get the raw material from uh, from US government's uh, storage area. And once the miners realized that their strategy is not gonna be effective for long, they started producing and uh, price came down to 35 to $40. So that is a kind of example where you you're kind, kind of don't have too many solutions unless you develop alternate materials. And that's what to, led us to develop alternate material for some of the uses of tantalum. That's one example. Other example is recently that you have seen the uh, difficulty in purchasing the, purchasing the cars, which is related to the supply of the silicon chips. And Chuva has a lot of experience in that area. And I guess as a result of what happened in last couple of years, uh, our president decided to bring the production of the chips back to US. So now I get, get to my presentation. So the disruptions at the manufacturing facilities, equipment is down, labor shortage, cannot get feed stock. That's what I just talked about. Uh, supplier decided to go out of business. Again, you don't have much control. And uh, the last one, supplier doesn't want to do business with you. It happens sometimes for whatever reason, but not very common. Then uh, spikes in demand. There's another big factor for the disruption. Uh, transportation, political unheaval, upheaval, natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, weather, you know, you can see that happening in uh, northeast, eastern part of this country when something like what happened in Buffalo, when things uh, with, with very heavy snow, nothing moves. So that causes disruption. 
changes in government policies and regulations and hoarding. That's what I talked about. That's what miners did. And I've seen hoarding being used in uh, uh, food industry, especially the country I come from in India. Hoarding of the food is very common to raise the price. And again, there are ways to get around it. And that's I'll get to next. To uh, next slide, please. So one thing is that wherever possible, use commercially available components as opposed to custom-made products. Because if you have commercially available components, you have uh, it's easier to get more than one supplier. And the other is uh, work with the physically close suppliers uh, so that you are not uh, dependent on the weather or other aspects related to the transportation. Now, one thing to keep in mind that to just in time and building the inventory are two opposite to, uh, factors that need to be considered. Just in time means that you keep your inventory to the minimum and which means that uh, uh, you are more prone uh, to have the disruption in the supply chain. Uh, then other critical factor is trade off between the low cost material from foreign countries and the associated trade risk. Uh, over the period of years, uh, I am firm believer that to made in USA is much better than buying from foreign countries if you want to have a good supply, reliable uh, source of your raw material. Then buyer cartel group purchasing, it can be used sometimes, but you need to do a lot of planning for that. You know, you have a seller's cartel for the gas, for example. You can also have buyer's cartel or have like group purchasing. Here, your three or four companies, like co-op type purchasing. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Cuba. Yeah, suggestions of mitigating the disruption, have resilient supply chain model, uh, which means that to uh, have supply from, have more than one supplier as well as to have alternate uh, uh, material available for the <coughs> alternate material as well as alternate process. But for to do that, you will need the customer approval and uh, planning. Make sure that you have customer approval before you need it. Then you can get insurance policy against disruption, but it again depends how much the policy will cost. Then have a good contract with your supplier, expected price and delivery with the supplier. And that will provide you some protection, but if the, your supplier decides to go out of the business, they know not much you can do. And the last one is very important. Have a clear understanding of expectations about the product quality. It is better to have a specification. Uh, right now, Ellen and I, I have a client who is having this issue because uh, the specifications were not uh, documented with the supplier. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, when you have, when you get the supplier from foreign country, it becomes even more difficult. It's nice to have a person in the country of origin to work with the supplier and make sure that the person do, that you hire is working for you and not for the supplier. In court terms that are in force and therefore who bears what responsibilities for the delivery of the product. It's a legal document, it's nice to have. Uh, it provides you some protection, but again, if the supplier is, uh, it doesn't want to supply, not much you can do. Same thing with a participate in custom tried partnership against terrorism. Buffer inventory maintained in the United States by the supplier. It's very critical to have. 
uh, where you do not bear the cost of the inventory as your supplier does, but the inventory is kept in US so that uh, you are more likely to have a good supply. Then ensure that harmonized tariff ports are correct and up to date and buyer and seller should clearly include them in all the paperwork. So these are some of the ideas that you need to consider when you're working with the foreign supplier. Again, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you, PK. My message is that try to have your supplier within the country. If you really, really have to go out, uh, talk to people who are uh, who do this for a living. They can guide you as to how to work with a foreign supplier. Okay, Chuba, you Thank want? You. Thank you, BK. Uh, can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. Uh, the, again, you've got the messaging from the uh, uh, panelists here today. Um, the key, the key, the we have a number of uh, score resources that are available to you. Um, these, some of these are actually uh, displayed right now on the screen. Um, we have uh, uh, a number of these panelists available also for additional discussion. Um, if you have uh, an interest in being mentored, um, you can get uh, to talk to any one of these panelists, including myself, um, you can get, get scheduled to have a mentoring session. Um, in addition, um, more, more again, more, more of the information that you that will be sharing with you, and then some acknowledgments. Uh, Teresa, are you there? Are we going to go through the Q and A? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, um, I would strongly encourage anyone at this time to go ahead and put your questions into chat. We will get those asked to our panelists. If you are, do not want to have to type into chat, you're also welcome to use the raised hand icon and we can unmute you so that you may ask your, your question. Uh, so um, we don't have any questions posted at this time, but we definitely would encourage you to go ahead and put those questions into into chat for us. Um, meanwhile, I am posting some of the information that uh, what you saw on the slide into chat for you. And if we have any, like I said, you're welcome to do the raised hand icon and we can unmute you. Okay. Um, I'll, I'm going to assume that we have no questions. So um, if none of the panelists have anything else they want to add, we can go ahead and close today's um, presentation. Now, I do encourage you to ch check out our YouTube channel. You'll find the recording for today's presentation uh, there. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, you. everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.